Joshua chapter 11, I'll begin reading in verse 16, recognizing I'm jumping right into the middle of a context, but be that as it may, I'll begin reading in verse 16, reading through the end of the chapter. Again, this is the word of God. Let's heed it even this afternoon. Joshua 11, beginning with verse 16. So Joshua took all that land, the hill country and all the Negev and all the land of Goshen, in the lowland, in the Arabah, in the hill country of Israel, in its lowland, from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, as far as Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. And he captured all their kings and struck them and put them to death. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. They took them all in battle. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed just as the Lord commanded Moses. Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah. And from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod did some remain. So Joshua took the whole land, according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's ask for his help, because I failed to do that in the pastoral prayer, so let's ask for his help as we consider this portion of it, his word in its preaching this afternoon. Father, as we again turn to these matters and matters that seem so foreign to us, all these names, all of these places that we know very little about and will probably never visit, but given to us by your spirit to teach us something about our Christian pilgrimage and indeed the hope you have for us. And so may you grant to us insight and understanding. May your spirit be our teacher and our guide. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Many of you know, and if you don't know, you will know in just a few moments, I served in a very short stint in the United States Army. And of course, like most recruits in the military, I spent a significant amount of time, eight weeks it seems, it seemed significant, it was only eight weeks, but it was eight weeks nonetheless in what we know as basic training. I did so not in the best time of the year. It was the hot summer sun of July in Columbia, South Carolina. And if you've ever lived in South Carolina in the middle of July, you know just what I'm talking about. It was brutal. It was hot. It was difficult. And oftentimes, and in one particular time, I remember vividly wanting and only wanting one thing, and that was rest. We have been going for about three straight days, being marched hither and yon to do this and to do that, and I was so exceedingly tired that I actually fell asleep marching. We were tired, and we were weary. We were weary from all the things that we were given to do. We were weary from all the exercises we were charged to do. We were weary from all the training. We were just weary from the weather. We were weary from all the influences around us. We were simply weary, and the only thing we wanted, I wanted, was to be at rest. Well, much the same way we see here in this really uh, uh, interesting chapter in the narrative of Joshua, we see just that. We see a people who for chapters on chapters now have been battling uh, foreigners. They, they've been battling uh, the occupants of Canaan. They've been battling people who are opposed to the kingdom of God, to the church of God, to, the, to that which God has made, uh, mandated and commanded. We've seen them begin, of course, in that, that, that battle of Jericho and moving to that, that difficult time with Ai and then again uh, against Ai and the victory that occurred there. Uh, We've seen, again, in in multiple situations in which they took on numerous kings and numerous people all throughout the land of Israel that they might keep the command of the Lord to fight, to battle, to devote to destruction those who must be displaced from their land because God had given it to them. 
But what is often missed, and this chapter does highlight for us, is that all the time they're doing it, there is indeed a goal. It is not as though the God of heaven simply commanded them to do these things because he could. Because they were at his disposal and they were to do whatever he told them to do. No, indeed, there was always a goal. There was always an uh, an objective. There was always something at the end. There was a hope that was set before them constantly. And what was that hope? That they might inhabit the land and find rest from the labors of which they've been involved in for many, many years. This hope, of course, was given to their father, their forefather, many, many hundreds of years previous, to even to Abraham, when, they, when he was promised uh, there in, in Genesis 15 that they would indeed inhabit a land that is not their own, that they would come back to the place of Abraham's dwelling, and they would take this land, it would be their place, it would be their rest, this is where they would end up being. In the meantime, they languished under the cruelness of Pharaoh for 430 years, wondering when the promise of God was ever going to be fulfilled, but never forgetting that promise. And Moses comes on the scene, and he delivers the people out of Egypt, moves them carefully across the Sinai Peninsula to the great place of worship there where they receive the law and the commands of God and the promise and the hope is still there, echoing in their minds, echoing in their ears. I will give you the land. I will give you rest. I will be your God. You will be my people. And here in this chapter, we see, at least in part, that very answer coming to rest, coming to pass in the rest that they are granted from their labors. What does that teach us? None of you, of course, are going to languish, probably, I suspect, in Egypt for 430 years. That I'm, that I'm certain. Most of you are not going to travel to Israel. Most of you are not going to see these cities, if they even exist anymore. Most of you couldn't pronounce their names if you had to. So what does this teach us? It teaches us one singular thing theme, one singular idea that we as God's people who are living as the church militant today, as pilgrims in the world that does not want us and does not care for us, we must recognize that as we're engaged in this battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, there is hope. There is an end game to this entire narrative of our lives, of the church militant. We will not go on this way for eternity. There is a point in which the church militant will indeed be the church at rest. That is to say that the church will indeed inherit the prize. The prize, the promise that God has given to his church. And he will dwell with them for eternity. They will be in his midst. They will be at peace in the new heavens and the new earth. And so the question comes as we begin to consider this section of Joshua's, of of this narrative, do you as a Christian keep your eye on the goal? It is easy, I suspect, brothers and sisters, to lose sight of the goal when you're in the middle of the battle. It's easy to lose sight of the goal when trials seem to come from every direction, when hardship comes from places you never expected, maybe did expect. It's hard to keep your eyes on the goal When all of the world seems to be against you. What is it Luther said? All hell may shake against you. It may seem that way. And it may seem that way. The question is, do you remember the goal? Do you remember, as it were, the prize? Do you remember the promise that God has given to you? Perhaps you're here this afternoon. And if you're like me, the weariness of this world and the stresses of it all and the things that can't be controlled, and that's to say most of it, not everything, the struggle with sin, doing battle against the world, the flesh, and my own self is exhausting. It's tiring. And oftentimes, all you can say is, come quickly, Lord Jesus, for I am tired of it all. Maybe you're like that this afternoon. Remember the goal. Remember the promise that you will not be lost. 
that there is coming a day when the land will be at rust. It'll be at rust from war. There is coming a day when the battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil will no longer be the case, for it will be long in our past. God has promised it, and he will certainly bring it to pass. And so I'm going to show you this afternoon in this narrative account that the long battle of this life will result in the long-awaited rest guaranteed by the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you and maybe perhaps remind you that the long battle of this life will result in the long-awaited rest guaranteed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Two points as we consider uh, this narrative. I'm certainly not going to deal with all the twists and turns of the accounts and deal with all the cities, and if you were hoping for that, I hate to disappoint. I'm going to deal with the theme. First, we will consider the long battle. The battle that really is emblematic of our existence, our lives. But then we will also consider the awaited rest. The long battle, it's where we are now, but also with an eye to the awaited rest, as illustrated here in this narrative account in Joshua chapter 11. First, the long battle. We can tell right away from the narrative itself that it's a comprehensive examination and re-explanation of the various twists and turns of the people of Israel in that day. It is a comprehensive look. It's complete. The term all shows up numerous times throughout this account, throughout this narrative. All the kings of it, all the kings of this, and all the kings of that, and they did this, and they did it. It's a comprehensive catalog of all of the battles that they were engaged in. Highlighting for us, as it does, that the demands of Jehovah were met. The demands to walk faithfully before him and to do all that he has said. Regardless of the difficulties and regardless of the odds that were before them. In Numbers chapter 13, some of this is highlighted for us long before we even get to the matters in which they are about to take the land and overcome it. One of the great difficulties of them taking this land was the opposition they had to it even before they got foot, put foot in it. Even opposition that comes even from the very people of God themselves. But notice the difficulties. Verse 28 of Numbers 13, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now in Numbers or Joshua chapter 11, that those people, that people group is named specifically. Perhaps done so by the narrator in such a way as to show that the misgivings of the people in Numbers 13 were just that, misgivings. That God, regardless of the barriers that seem humanly impossible to overcome, will be and have been overcome, not by the people, but ultimately by the God of heaven. Even verses 31 to 33 in Numbers 13. Then the man who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Not exactly the most encouraging thing to hear when you're told to go take a land. What you want me to do, what? Be like me fighting Muhammad Ali. Well, I guess I wouldn't be doing that anymore. Mike Tyson. Forget it. It's not a contest. We are not able to go up, they said. They are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report for the land when they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great heights. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Enoch. Again, there it is, that people group who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Deuteronomy chapter 1, continuing just to underscore the, the difficulties of this endeavor, this campaign to take the land. Deuteronomy chapter 1, 
Verse 26, Moses is speaking, he's really preaching, yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Talk about hyperbole. And besides, we have seen the sons of Anakim there. They're afraid. They recognize the difficulty of the battle. They recognize the difficulty of the endeavor, the campaign. It's impossible. Chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2 of Deuteronomy. Again, underscoring the idea that this was a very daunting task. Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 and 2. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go into dis to dis dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, and there they are again, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? But yet they did, didn't they? As they went in under the headship of Joshua, they went in and, they, and we read there in verse 16, Joshua took all the land, the hill country, and all the Negev, and all the land of Goshen, and the low land, and the Arabah, the hill country of Israel, and its low land. But notice all, all these places, all that the land, the hill country, and all the Negev, and all the land of Goshen. This battle was a, a thorough one in which they accomplished and put to death those opponents of the God of heaven. Now look, we sometimes face difficult odds. You know, if you don't think that, or if you've never experienced that, then frankly, you haven't been living very long. When you consider the relationship of the Christian experience over against the world and the flesh and the devil, you recognize that the odds are very, very steep. And the battles can seem very, very arduous and difficult, even hard even maybe impossible. We face these things throughout our experience as Christians. But we must never forget the very lesson that Joshua learned early on in the taking of Canaan, and that is the Lord fights for us. That he is the commander of the army of the Lord, and there is nothing impossible for him. What is it Luther said in the hymn that we sing and know all so well? One little word that shall fell the enemy of our souls. Is anything too hard for the Lord to accomplish? And so while we may feel and we may think and we may believe and we may even understand the difficulty of doing battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, we must remember that as we do it, the Lord is our guide. And he is the one who will bring to ruin any who oppose him and his church and his people. The odds notwithstanding, he will indeed attain complete and total victory. But it's not only comprehensive in the sense that it's complete. It is comprehensive in the sense of the commander who leads them. While it's true in this narrative account in Joshua 11, really throughout the entirety of Joshua, Joshua is, is indeed the spotlight, as it were, throughout this summary section of the book. But he is a type, isn't he? He is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Of this there can be no mistake Think of the number of illusions that Joshua himself, going right back to the meaning of his name, all the way through to the things that he does and accomplishes under the guidance of Jehovah to highlight the fact that he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who fights for his church and fights for his people. In your mind, rewind all the way back to Joshua chapter 1 as he's given the mandate, he's given the work, he's given the things to do by God himself. And what is that? To go and take this land into a land that I will give to you. To meditate upon the law of the Lord day and night. The Lord Jesus grew in wisdom and in the knowledge of God and grew in favor with God and men. He was told to take the people across the Jordan River to a land in which God has given to them. And he does that. 
Jesus Christ took his people across the Jordan as he stood in the Jordan for us as a picture of he who would conquer the world, the flesh, and the devil. He stood in that place of baptism as a symbol, as a picture that we might in him cross the Jordan River and find the victory that only he can bring. Think of the things that Christ did as he served the people. Joshua, at the end of this book, you will note that he becomes one just like Moses as he's described as a servant of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ was the servant par excellence, serving not only sinful people, but serving his Father and doing only his will. All of it, why? That he might then give his life as a, as a ransom, as a sacrifice, that which would redeem us, that which would secure a comprehensive victory over the world, the flesh, and the enemy of our souls. And so it's comprehensive in its picture, given to us, rooted to us in that form of the events that took place from, six, from chapters, uh, verses 16 to the end of the chapter, but really as a summary of the entirety of the book itself. But there's also a connection. There's a connection that, that is threaded throughout the entirety of the book of which this section brings forward for us. And that is the connection of God's promises. He told Joshua that he would give them the land. He told him that they would be victorious, regardless of the odds, regardless of the situation. He made a promise to his people. He promised to bring them there. He promised to give to the Lord Jesus Christ a redeemed people that they might with him cross the Jordan and be successful, victorious over the world, the flesh, and the devil. He has made great promises to you and to me as those who are united to him, that he who does the battle, he who labors against the enemies, will indeed take us in his train to that place of rest and hope that we all long for. There's the connection of God's promises, but there's also then also the connection of God's vindication and judgment. Over who? Over those that would oppose the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over the enemies of the gospel, over those who in this day and age think they are winning when they are in fact losing. It's subtly there in the text, and if you look very carefully there, In verse 20, for it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts. Whose hearts? The hearts of the enemy. The hearts of those that that Israel was going to devote to destruction. the, The ones that would stand in opposition to the gospel and the kingdom of God. That the people of God might then destroy them. Why? So that the people get glory? No, that God would. For it is he that is doing it. He is the one who judges them by hardening their hearts that they might be utterly destroyed, that they make, might make no plea for grace. Now, you may think as you hear that, you might think this seems somewhat contrary to many things that I have been, you've been taught your, throughout your Christian life. But we must remember as we read these words that our God is in the heavens, And he does whatever he pleases. The psalmist tells us that in Psalm 115, verse 3. And he was pleased as he executes his judgment against the nations to harden their heart that they might not believe, that they might not turn, that they might stand instead in opposition against the church, that the church then therefore, due to the opposition, might be conformed more and more into the image of Christ He was pleased to harden their heart for that reason. Paul talks about this in Romans 9. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And Paul responds to those who might object to such a thing, who might downplay the idea that God actually hates. And Paul says, who are you to question the actions of a holy God. 
The text plainly says that he hardened their hearts against the people. Our response, frankly, should simply not to be to question or to attempt to pry into the secret counsel of God's determinative will. This is what he did. And we take it at plain, common sense, giving of the words. For he tells us the reason he did it. He did it so that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed. This is not the first time God has done this. The first time that God has done this. In your mind's eye, think back to the previous era in the life of Israel. As they sat in Egypt, languishing under the cruelness of the taskmasters. Day after day, wondering if God had abandoned them, if God had forgotten about them. And we read at the end of Exodus chapter 2 that God saw and he knew the struggles of his people. And so he brings forth from his people a man, Moses, who goes and he does battle against the world, against the false gods of Egypt. And during that battle, we read numerous times that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. I've heard different theologians try to explain that away in some other way to somehow take God off the hook. The fact of the matter is, God did that. He did that, that he might then demonstrate his glory, he might demonstrate his greatness, he might demonstrate his might and his power against the forces of evil, against the world that stands in opposition to the church of Christ, that he might get the glory for it all. And so we don't pry into the secret counsel of God's will. Our response is simply be one of fear and worship as he seeks to protect his people and mold them and conform them more into Christ himself. God's promises, God's vindication, his judgment against the people. What is that vindication? Maybe you're like me, you think the world belittles Christians, they do. They think less of Christians, they do. They ought not. It seems kind of silly, actually, and it's almost backwards for them to be angry at a people that have have as their charter to serve and help the, the hopeless and the helpless of the world. But it's opposite that, isn't it? God's people have often throughout her history been mistreated, been accused, maligned, wrongly imprisoned, put to death. The history of the church is full of these stories. But it's not a story without hope. There is a vindication. There is hope, even in the hardship. And here in this text, again, we have that illustrated for us. That regardless of how difficult the circumstance and the odds that were against them and the and the insults and the issues that were presented to them, God vindicated them. And God's people will be ultimately vindicated for their labors in their war with the world and the flesh and the devil. Lose sight of these things, you lose hope. Lose sight of these things and you wonder why I'm bothering Lose sight of these things and you give in and surrender, throw up the white flag and get run over. Lose sight of these things and you are hopelessly lost. But as we keep those goals always before us and we keep these things always before us, we see the reason to continue, to keep laboring, to battle. For what? For the awaited rest that has been promised to every Christian Everyone who is found united to Christ. We see in this leading up to the awaited rest, we note the obedience of Joshua. Notice how it tells us that he was careful to follow the law of the Lord as Moses has pres- had prescribed it. One commentator puts it this way when he says, The conquest of the land unfolded according to divine dictates, not the whims of of man. 
Let me read that again. Because I think you missed it. Well, maybe you did, but I'm going to read it again anyway. And that's not a motion. Boy, tough, tough bunch. The conquest of the land unfolded according to divine dictates, not the whims of man. You want to be successful and arrive at that long-awaited rest that God has provided for you? You have to do it His way. The problem for us most of the time is we want to do it our way. The problem for the world is that they want to do it their way. God says, no, that's not how this works. You will do it my way. If we are to be successful, we, like Joshua, we, we must follow the mandates of the Lord. What are those things? I know you're probably going to get tired of me saying it. Too bad, I'm going to keep saying it using the means that God has given to His church. You want to be successful and arrive at the long-awaited rest if you want to persevere to the end and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You can't do it your way. you got to do it His. That's the only path. That's the only way. There isn't another one. The first way, of course, is through, who he, through Him, through He who is our Sabbath rest. That picture, of course, that was secured by Christ. He who is our rest. Rest from what? Rest from sin. Rest from the tyranny of sin. Rest from the dominion of sin. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. No man comes to the Father. No man finds their eternal rest. No man will land in the new heavens and the new earth without him. You must go through him. There is no other doorway. There is no other path. All other roads lead to an eternal destruction. I was talking to one person one time and convinced in his own mind, sadly, that all roads that ultimately lead to heaven, even if they're, as long as they're sincere. Jesus would disagree. The Bible disagrees. The first way in which we find ourselves securing that awaited rest that has been promised to us is through the cross of Christ. There is no other way. Joshua, in order to secure the promised rest in the land that was promised to him, he could not deviate from the plan. He couldn't decide that he knew better than Jehovah and to do what he wanted to do. Maybe he didn't want to devote all these people to destruction. Maybe he didn't want to execute all their kings that were in his midst. Maybe he didn't want to cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from the Hebron, from Debir, and all these places that are listed. Maybe he had other ideas. Maybe he was even sincere or would have been sincere. All of it would have led to ruin. No, he needed to do all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. Verse 23. We too then, therefore, come through the doorway of Christ and then we utilize the means that Christ has given to his church, the word, the sacraments, and prayer that we might then secure as, the, as we follow he who is the good shepherd of the sheep, the commander of the army of the Lord of hosts, may secure that awaited rest. In the successor of Moses, we see very much that picture of Christ and all that he accomplishes for us. I got ahead of myself in my notes, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. The point is clear. Joshua is a type of Christ. And the end is what we want. The end is there. It's at the end of the chapter, which we read these very striking words, and the land had rest from war. The land had rest from war. Like them, us too, will come to that point. 
It will be stamped as an epitaph on our lives at the end when Christ returns. The war against these things that we've seen over and over again through the book of Joshua will no longer be the case. My struggle with sin, the constant needing to mortify the deeds of the flesh, the constant dealing with individuals and having to apologize and hearing apologies and, 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 and the battle against the world and all of its ideologies that are wrong and hateful and misguided and wrong-headed. The battles against he who hates me and hates my soul and wants me dead will all be done. The land will have rest from war. We think of this narrative here in light of our lives, just in the life that's present. We must remember, then, the promise. Remember the question I began with. Do you keep your eyes on the goal in the midst of the misery and the hardship and the battle? Do you keep your eyes always focused on he who will take you to the goal. As soon as you take your eyes off that, you are in trouble. As soon as you deviate from the plan in this life that God has given, you're in trouble for you're outside of the safety net that God has provided you. So in this life, we can rest. We can We rest in the promises that God has given. By faith, believing that all of this battle and struggle will come to a rest in the life to come. A rest in which there is no more battle, no more wars, no more sickness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more struggle with sin, no more apologies, no more having to hear apologies. On it goes. Until then, we must be like Joshua. We must be like faithful followers of he who is the greater Joshua, Christ himself. We follow him. As he does battle for us, we do battle with him against the things that seem so hard sometimes, trusting that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world, keeping our eyes always Always on the target, the goal, the eternal rest that God has promised to all those who love him. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word and confess to you that we often forget the end when we're in the middle of the battle. We think sometimes it's going to go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But it won't. You remind us of our need to keep our eyes on the goal, our eyes on Christ. You give us the grace to weather these things. We thank you that you are indeed greater than any obstacle that may be in front of us. And in you, we have an eternal hope, a glorious promise that one day we will be the land that is at rest from war. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.